Uh, yeah, I'm going to be talking about uh, tension for HGI, and uh, this is joint work in collaboration with my colleagues, Eric Miguel and uh, Christine Kondi. So what I'm going to be talking about is uh, why attention is necessary for HGI and why the situation for attention is completely different than with uh, narrow HGI. Uh, I'm going to be explaining what constructivist methodology is all about and talk about, a bit about how to design an attention <coughs> mechanism. So uh, just to start by some definitions, uh, in the domain of intelligent systems, the allocation of resources are typically what we call attention. So uh, biological human attention, for example, uh, is basically the selection, the selective concentration or, but on particular aspects of the environment where some others are involved. If we try to uh, turn this problem over to artificial intelligence, uh, we can say that the problem is resource management and control to assign limited system resources to the processing of the most important and relevant information. Now, we need attention uh, for, because of three features of operation. And, uh, so when they are all present, we need it, and if you take away any one, uh, we don't need it, but the features are when we have time constraints, when we have abundant information, and when we have limited resources. I think uh, we can agree mostly that these features will be present for the kind of, kinds of ATI systems we are, uh, find desirable in the future. Uh, the situation with narrow AI is that uh, if we have a detailed specification of the task and the end environment the system will be facing at design time, we already know or we can know what kind of information the system will be dealing with, how frequently it has to uh, sample information from the environment, how quickly it has to make decisions, and uh, we have some idea about the resource requirements of the system. We can use this uh, to perform a major reduction in complexity uh, as compared to dealing with the raw real world because we can, in a sense, pre-program the information filtering because we already know what information will be interesting and uh, we can uh, basically handcraft the resource management mechanisms because of uh, all that we can know from the specifications. So uh, narrow AI systems will usually not have to do uh, substantial dynamic adaptation at runtime. However, <clears throat> with AGI, we usually have a partially specified or even unspecified tasks and environments that the system will be dealing with. So we don't know, at least not fully, what kind of information will be relevant to the system, how frequently the system has to sample the environment, how quickly it has to make decisions, and what the resource requirements will be. So if you look at this, uh, Chart here, and uh, this axis is basically increasing uh, levels of abstraction for the specification of the system and its goal. Narrow AI systems tend to be specified all the way down to the ground, and by that I mean down to uh, perception and action. Uh, the case is different with ATI systems. These are systems that we want to supply with a high level goals, but we don't tell them all the way down to action and perception how it can be achieved. They don't uh, start out with sufficient initial knowledge to, to uh, achieve all their goals. And uh, the initial knowledge at lower levels of abstractions uh, will usually be incomplete. They have to learn to perceive and act meaningfully in the environment. And they have to learn, basically, to realize their high-level goals in the environment. So when we design an ATI system, a practical ATI system, we want to operate in the real world, we have to make some assumptions up front. We have to assume that the system has incomplete knowledge at a good time. We have to assume the system has to deal with real world complexity, both in environments and uh, its tasks. And we have to assume that all information is potentially important. We don't have the luxury of uh, excluding, uh, using tricks to exclude the information early. The resources of the system will not only be insufficient, but not only be limited, but they will be insufficient at always, all the time. And uh, the tasks, environment, and time constraints the system has to deal with will be dynamic. So uh, this is just a summary of these points. Uh, so the big point is that uh, ATI has unique and uh, very profound requirements, in my opinion, for attention 
And uh, I don't see signs in the AGI community that this has been, the importance of this has been fully appreciated. Hopefully uh, this will change. So uh, the research goal I've been working on is to create a general attention mechanism that is to be implemented in AGI systems or cognitive architectures. Uh, I'm not inspired by biology to a high degree, but of course any work on attention is at a high level inspired by it. So the methodology uh, uh, we are using is constructivist AI, and this was presented by uh, Chris Olson in 2009. So constructivist AI targets uh, systems that manage their own growth from some manually constructed initial state. And it's basically a methodology for building flexible AGI systems that can autonomously self-reconfigure uh, down to the architecture level. Now the reason we find this to be uh, a very viable and perhaps the only realistic way to achieve AGI, at least in our opinion, is to, for reasons that have to do with complexity, scaling, and uh, cognitive limitations of humans as system designers, implementers, and debuggers. But I will not go further into that because uh, I don't have time in this talk. The design requirements uh, I have for the attention mechanism are the following. Uh, I want a general mechanism that doesn't make any limiting assumptions about the tasks, environments, or modalities that the system will have. Uh, the mechanism design is architecture independent. There are some architectural constraints, which I will mention. But I'm not targeting any single uh, attention for any single cognitive architecture. So the mechanism also has to be adaptive. It has to learn from its experience. And it should be complete in that it targets both information coming from the external environment and also information generated within the system. Also complete in the sense that it implements both top-down and bottom-up attention. Top-down attention is deliberate attention and bottom-up is uh, more reactive. Shortly put. Finally, uh, the mechanism should be uniform in that data is treated identically no matter from what modalities it comes from at the cognitive levels. This still allows uh, for the possibility of some pre-processing feature detection and whatnot. So uh, there is already uh, some implementation of attention in some, uh, although few cognitive architectures. Uh, the work that exists suffers from uh, uh, one to all of these uh, limitations, depending on the case. Uh, first, is they only focus on the data, the filtering data, but they ignore what to do with the data. Usually, there will be several different possibilities uh, in processing the data. Uh, the second one is uh, that it's common to see the focus be applied solely to external information, ignoring uh, the application of attention to internal states. And finally, uh, real-time processing is uh, virtually never really addressed. So uh, the high-level functional requirements uh, put forth for attention are basically the system-wide quantification of data relevance, number one, and uh, the relevance of data in the system can be determined by its relation to active goals which is the top-down method, and the novelty and unexpectedness of the data. How unusual or surprising is this data given prior operating experience? Secondly, it's a system-wide quantification of process relevance. So process relevance can be determined from the operational experience of the system. How has a particular process performed in the past in achieving certain goals? Uh, and also, the data that is available for processing. So, <clears throat> uh, attention, it turns out, has some interesting uh, uses for supporting constructivist AI methodology. <coughs> because internally, within the system, we can envision another dynamic, complex environment that is not in some sense, that is in some sense like uh, the external task environment. Uh, for constructivist AI to work, uh, we need metacognitive functions that control the growth of the systems, but these processes are also subject to the same resource constraints as the rest of the system. 
So the idea is to apply a single unified attention mechanism to both the internal and external environments to create ATI systems that can perform tasks and at the same time improve their own performance, all, but all while being subject to time constraints and resource limitations. I mentioned, uh, although the, this is not an architecture-dependent design, there are some architectural constraints. Attention turns out to be notoriously difficult to carve out because it's related to so many other processes in the system. I don't have time to uh, motivate or explain in detail these constraints. I refer you to the paper for this. But the constraints are the architecture has to be data-driven. Uh, all processing occurs then as, uh, in response to the occurrence of data. Fine-grained, the processing and data units in the systems are small but numerous. Predictive capabilities, there has to be a mechanism capable of generating predictions because this is necessary control data for attention. And unified sensory processes that treat information identity, whether it comes from the outside or within the system. So, if we visualize this, uh, our data items, uh, we give them a parameter called saliency, which quantifies the relevance of this data in the current operating situation. Then we have processes which have an activation value, which is also a quantification of their importance given the situation. So the high level role of attention then is to quantify and assign these parameters to data and processes. And the execution policy then becomes quite simple. You want to execute the most active processes on the most salient data items. So if we envision, this is not any particular architecture, but uh, if we envision a system with this uh, pension mechanism, we have here a collection of all the data within the system. We have the processes of the system. Here we have a real world complex environment with its own time constraints, and we have sensory devices that capture the data and generate new data items. Uh, because it's a data-driven system, uh, processing occurs if there is a match between a data item and the process who uh, accepts this kind of input. Now, if a process runs, it will always generate some data, usually, and uh, it can also create commands to actuation devices, which then produce some action in the environment which is then sensed back in the system, closing the perception action loop. <coughs> so there's no attention in here yet, but uh, if we start here, we can derive uh, so-called attentional patterns from our goals and predictions, because our goals refer to concrete elements, whether it's inside the system or outside. So we can uh, see what the goal is focusing on and generate a, a, a pattern to catch things that are related to that element. Now we intend to match this to the data that we have, and if you find the match, we give a bias to the data item that, uh, that has the match, which basically means increasing its saliency. So we also analyze the data uh, for novelty and unexpectedness based on some, uh, the entire or more likely some subset of the prior operating history of the system. <coughs> if something usual occurs, we again increase the latency of the data item in question. So this is the top down and bottom up attention for, for information, for, for data. However, uh, we still haven't tackled the process side. So there are two components to this. The first one is uh, we give some activation to processes that fit the data that is currently available. This is uh, the most trivial step in, of the mechanism. But uh, then we evaluate the context of the system and we give, based on a performance history of processes in the system, we compare our goals to goals that were previously achieved. And when we find sufficiently similar goals and we know a process has been responsible for uh, achieving that goal in the past, we use experience-based process activation to give increased activation to a process that is likely to be useful now. So that's an overview of the mechanism. 
uh, interestingly, although I sent out to uh, just focus on attention, this kind of resembles a very large part of a control mechanism for cognitive architecture. The current status of the work that uh, the implementation of uh, an early version is complete, the evaluation is in progress, and uh, this work was done as part of the Humanos project. This is a project where we created a new cognitive architecture called ERA. We, uh, this project went a long way towards establishing the feasibility and value of constructivist methods. So uh, if you're interested, I encourage you to check out the website. I just passed uh, the final European Union review with the applying colors, and there are some new videos and uh, interesting stuff. So, uh, just the only way to end is thank you for your attention. <laughs>